It's an interesting thing that um, I'm, I'm actually working on a piece about our jobs, and I, I think that is the crucial key, and it's something that I came to um, to recognize early on, which has made my life fairly difficult, I have to say, because I've recognized early on how destructive all of our jobs are and all of our work that we do to not only the environment, but to other people. And I think that's a key that we need to focus on. If we, I mean, I, I am uh, with you. I don't know if it's, yeah, it's delusional, I think, to think that we are going to turn this all around and everything's going to be okay. But I do think there are many things that we can do to oh, minimize absolutely. the suffering that all these people are going through. Mm -hmm. You know, the income inequality and the devastating destruction caused by climate change and the toxification of the planet. And, and I think one of the keys is to start recognizing the work we do, which is the bulk of our lives and how destructive so much of it is. Probably the, the largest percentage of work that we do, even in jobs that we think aren't destructive, like medicine. Medicine is healing. Well, medicine also creates an environmental nightmare. And, um, and it also does some harm that we don't think about. Um, and so I think it's funny that you brought up your job and your work and coming to recognize that, because I think that's one of the things that we all need to recognize the most. And I think if we change our jobs and our systems, that might be one of the best ways we can heal things. Right. I'm Dean Walker, and welcome to the Poetry of Predicament podcast, a podcast for people brave enough to face humanity's challenges and problems, and most importantly, our numerous predicaments. The Poetry of Predicament is a podcast meant to inspire us to bring forth grace, beauty, and connection with the web of life in the face of a predicament-laden world. In this November 2018 episode of the Poetry of Predicament podcast, I hope you'll welcome Christine Mattis, a science communicator, commentator, analyst, online journalist with a remarkably heartful, clear, and no bullshit style of communicating about things that really matter. Look forward to speaking with Christine Mattis. We're going to start up uh, another episode of the Poetry of Predicament podcast here in the just a little bit before Thanksgiving in 2018. And I'm uh, just thrilled to have Christine Mattis uh, with us today. And uh, we'll, we'll uh, actually see Christine and um, get going with a conversation in just a moment. But I wanted to start with uh, just a piece of writing that um, I, I was just trying to explain. We're just meeting for the first time as well. And I was just trying to explain that, uh, you know, it's rare that these days I resonate so fully and so immediately with somebody's writing, somebody's expression about what's really going on. You know, it's, uh, it's a delight and it's a rarity. And so I just like to read a paragraph from a, a recent article uh, that I read in uh, Common Dreams that, uh, that really just spoke to me in a big way. So uh, just a moment here. Truth and consequences. The climate crisis, as many other environmental issues, isn't a scientific problem. It is a social, political, and economic one. As they say, it isn't rock and science, excuse me, it isn't rocket science, it is greed. A Green New Deal will not cut it because it leaves capitalism, corporatism, imperialism, and consumerism in place. We aren't going to science our way out of these crises. We can't advertise or market our way out, shop our way out, sing and dance or entertain our way out, fundraise our way out, engineer and genetically engineer our way out, protest our way out, text, tweet, Snapchat, or Instagram our way out, pray our way out, or even vote our way out. Our way out is dramatically, is to dramatically alter much of our way of life. 
It is to prioritize ecological concerns and do our best to conduct every aspect of our lives sustainably, rather than just pay lip service to our belief that climate change is real or that plastic pollution is a problem or that fossil fuel use is unsustainable. In many, if not most ways, we just simply need to stop. Our way of life is incompatible with the continuance of life. Christine Mattis, welcome. And uh, would you say hello to the folks? And uh, I would appreciate it very much if you would uh, just give us a little introduction of who you are and what got you to the place where you're writing like that. Um, thanks for having me and thanks for that flattering introduction. Um, let's see, who am I? I am, uh, I would characterize myself as an environmental writer. I graduated with a PhD in environment and resources. Um, I started out my education in biology and was interested in health and came to recognize that our health that medicine isn't, isn't the same as health. So when we talk about health and we talk about studying health care, we're really talking about medical care. And I came to recognize that a great deal of our health issues in modern society are a result of not only poor nutrition, and I don't mean malnutrition, which used to be an issue and still is an issue in many parts of the world, but in our modern technological society in America, it's a result of poor nutrition. Um, poor food products that we eat, and, and more even a result of our environment and what is all around us. The toxic pollutants that we encounter either, um, I don't want to say purposefully, but you know, with the cosmetics we use and the personal care products we use and the cleaners we use, but more so as a result of things that we can't control that are all around us, the air pollution and the water pollution from industry. Um, and of course, the poorest of the poor are the ones who are most affected by these things. So that's that was my beginning of where I got into this um, journey through studying climate. So I started out in biology, being interested in health, and it came to me that really our health is all about the health of the, our ecosystem and the health of the planet. And that took me to, um, well, between graduate school, I, I did some work in teaching and various other things. I worked on Capitol Hill and worked in science hearings. Um, but then I, I went back to graduate school to mainly be a part of um, trying to, I would say, solve these problems, but they're so huge and daunting. I'm not sure they're even solvable at this point, but at least it, what we can do is um, mitigate the effects of what we've done to the planet, what we've done to our personal health and the health of the ecosystem and all the other species on the planet. And so that brought me back to graduate school to study all this more in depth. And since then I've been working as a writer and advocate and um, involved in some environmental justice organizations to do what I can do on these issues. You know what I um, what I found in the work that I do in this arena, which is to work with people in uh, creating a safe container where an individual, a couple, a family, a, a work group, a, a community organization can um, allow themselves to feel what what's really going on. Um, that sort of feeling, that depth of feeling is certainly not usually invited or welcome in the business as usual culture. I'm curious, can you say, was there a sort of an awakening, awakening experience for you or a, an expression that I use an awful lot is to have our, our hearts cracked open in a good way. Um, can you recall, was there a, a particular opening experience that you had either early on that connected you with life at the level, at the systemic level that you seem to be talking from, 
or more recently or both? I, I don't know that I had sort of an epiphany. I think, um, hmm, I, I think maybe my interest in social justice throughout my even childhood, throughout my adolescence and then into college and my experience is there may have brought me to where I am because I think social justice is very much tied in with the environment and environmental justice and what's going on now. Um, so when I think about it, I, I you know, I, ha I don't know if you read a lot of Chris Hedges work. Mm -hmm. um, I, I imagine, yeah, you do. And I imagine maybe your viewers do too. Uh, I had an experience very similar to his. I, I had a very privileged uh, academic background, um, but I was not of the privileged class. So I, I w attended a prep school and I attended a fairly prestigious university and I was surrounded by people of a different socioeconomic class than I was. And I felt like a bit of a fish out of water, not intellectually, but um, maybe socially and economically. And what I saw around me, especially as I got to college and everybody was thinking about careers was, um, and I went to a Roman Catholic school that was very, um, very social minded and was, was um, promoting service and giving back. But at the same time, everybody was preparing and training for careers that I saw were detrimental to not only other people, but to the planet. So we have people in business school who are exploiting the planet and exploiting workers. And yet they're spending, you know, maybe once a month going to the homeless shelter or doing some volunteer work. And that is considered service and that is considered giving back. But it's really just one step up and two steps back, given what they're being trained for at university. And I, I think this is, this is what brought me to where I am. So I was very disillusioned um, going through that education and, and at the time seeing what sort of the real world and the adult world is. The adult world is actually um, training us to be destructive beings in this, in this planet. And um, that's how most of us make our money. We all do, whether we want to or not, many of us are doing things that are destructive to other people. I'll give you an example. I'm in California and the wildfires are a bit south of me. And um, I just heard a story this morning about a man. Um, it sounded like he was probably a middle-class man who had a home. He escaped with a really narrow time just drove away, couldn't take anything but his daughter with him and was able to get away from the fire, his house burned down. And so he's trying to figure out how to go on with his life. What he found out was that his insurance didn't cover fires. So he has lost everything. And his whole, you know, he may still have a job, but he has a home that he paid for and had a mortgage on and that is gone and he can't get any of that back. And there are insurance companies who are allowing this. There are people who work in these companies who purposely obfuscate their insurance plans. And, and when this devastating sort of thing happens, they allow for this person to not get his insurance and lose his whole life. And so that's what I mean when we're talking about you know, where this came to me, I realized we're being trained to do all of these really horrible things when it comes down to it, just for our own benefit, for our own careers, for our power, for our riches. And this is incompatible with continuing um, our lives on the planet because ecologically, all of these things we've done in our careers are have devastated the planet and are the, are the cause of our climate catastrophe. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm absolutely with you. I, uh, I just loop back to what we were talking about just before we started rolling this recording, which, which is that um, I, I just don't see a way of untangling this. Yeah. You know, there's um, there's a particular 
emphasis in the the conversation that is is now global um, but particularly in the USA where it's it's all about the IPCC it's all about a, a metric a single metric of mm -hmm. a single element literally of co2 mm -hmm. yeah. and the entire uh, conversation is is riveted at that point and then on top of that there's this corrosive uh, kind of uh, wrapping around the entire conversation, which calls the whole thing into doubt. So not only is it a useless single fixation for our attention mm -hmm. in the first place, but then to cast doubt on its validity and the validity of science at all, mm -hmm it seems like these pieces when i look at them and i put them together with a comment like or you know, sharing like you've just done it seems like each of those elements t distances us further from any kind of sense of reality much less agency mm -hmm. does that spark you to say anything um yeah a few things um First of all, I agree with you. We've been focused on carbon dioxide or just carbon emissions, and we're focused on fossil fuel companies and, and reducing or eliminating fossil fuels. And not to say that's a bad thing. We do need to do that. Mm. But I will agree. I When I went to graduate school, um, and my degree is in environment and resources, and my master's degree is in earth system science and policy, and we really focused on the climate crisis and and carbon emissions. And my interest actually, coming from where I said I came from in, in public health, was more on pollution and toxics. And um, that's that was kind of thrown by the wayside for this whole climate crisis, as if it's not happening because the climate crisis is more prevalent and more pressing. And I, I would argue that no, it's, it is, not to diminish the climate crisis, but they are both prevalent and pressing. And I think we've found that out now when, when we've suddenly discovered over the last year, I mean, like for example, um, many of us who work in science knew this, but this plastic pollution problem, mm. it, it seems like the world just discovered it over the past year, it, you know, it's been going on forever. But we have a myriad of problems and so we need to approach them in a more systemic way and not just, and, and it's, we, we just look at carbon, but that's very typical of science to be very reductionist. And that's one of the reasons I went into an interdisciplinary degree and have an interdisciplinary background. However, we still don't use that kind of interdisciplinary thinking and um, put these things together enough. Mm -hmm. Like what I wrote, uh, you know, scientific and technological solutions are not going to save us. We have to think about uh, economics. We have to think about society. We have to think about our day-to-day -day lives and our systems and our institutions and how they operate. And that is so beyond just a scientific or technological solution. Um, and so that's why I write about things in a more broad sense. It's very difficult to talk about it. And maybe that's why scientists are loath to talk about things in a more broad sense. It's, it's very hard. It can be overwhelming. Um, and also, there's this awful thing in science communication where um, academics and scientists feel that the public not only cannot handle so much information, they won't understand it. And it's 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 very patronizing, I think. I Good think answer. people are smarter than academics think, and I think they can handle it. And there is some research to show that people would rather hear the truth than be um, told you know, platitudes or yeah. told little I, bits of information. I would love for you to, to follow that thread further, but I, I would just like to add one other piece that, that mm -hmm. I find the most condescending of, of them all which is that um, we literally just don't have the capacity. You know, it's, it's like, um, oh, we don't want to disturb the children because they just can't handle it. They can't mm -hmm. handle the truth. It reminds me of that um, 
um, a few good men. It was, you know, the the Jack Nicholson. Yeah. You can't handle the truth. Yeah. I uh, wait a second. You know, so there's this there's this seamless control of the conversation that you're pointing to. Can you say some more about what you've seen from your perspective about how that is in place and how it's kept in place that conversation? Um, well, like you said, I, I, there's more at play than just the academics who are, you know, focusing. There's, there's of course the what what I think rules our world is the corporate and capitalist um, yeah. upper class and their desires and their um, what they want out of the world. And so for them, I felt that one of the reasons, you know, this is all just my um, opinion, but I felt that one of the reasons we became focused on carbon emissions and carbon dioxide was because it was something that the corporations could um, actually get on board with and they could they could move their fossil fuel operations into other operations and change their energy operations. So this, so then if we're not talking about the pollution, if we're not talking about industry and huge infrastructures and how uh, unsustainable these things are and the, the, the pollution they put out and the resource use they have, um, then we can just focus on climate change. We could just focus on, on, uh, energy and the, the corporations can maintain their power and their their economic structure and i when i was really getting into this in graduate school was the time that bp was saying it was beyond petroleum you know and so um i guess that's um i'm trying i'm tr sorry i'm going off on a tangent i think I'm trying to remember the thread you asked me, but I guess that's one way that we are not looking at the whole picture. To, to me, the, the, the center point of your writing and what drew me to want to speak with you today is back in that paragraph of yours that I read in which you, it just doesn't get any simpler than our way of operating. I call it the business as yeah. usual human operating system. It is not going, it's never been, and it never will be consistent with a, a life promotional way of yeah. being. Now and you said it much more smoothly in, in your paragraph, but I, you said it even simpler. You said much of this, we just need to stop. Right. And, and so that's why when I was saying about focusing on the transition to different energies and how fossil fuel companies, at, at first they were saying, okay, we can do this, I think. And now it's, forget it. We're not going to make the kind of money we want. And so it comes down to greed. It comes down to power and money. And these people just can't have enough. I mean, look at Jeff Bezos. I mean, this man could solve our poverty problem, our homeless problem, our medical insurance problem, or the fact that we should all have free Medicare and not have medical insurance. He could solve all these problems Let, with the spending the amount of money he has that's equivalent to me maybe buying a coffee with the amount of money I have. And it's just megalomania and sociopathy that these people operate under. Um, and yeah, we, what needs, I mean, from my perspective, what needs to happen is a lot of what we do that we take for granted, traveling across the country. I mean, I, I've traveled, I love to travel. I love to travel around the world. I was able to do it as a young child when my dad worked for airlines, we could travel for free. But this is unsustainable. The airline industry is unsustainable. Um, and there's no way, to make it sustainable in the short term with the, with the, um, what we're facing, with the situation and the predicament we're in. And we have to realize these things and we just need to stop. We can't say we'll continue business as usual in all of these things we do. Um, so I think our focus needs to not be on economic growth and, and ecological economists have said this forever. We can't keep looking at, you know, the 
bottom line of economy. We can't keep looking at the quarterly earnings and the exponential growth of the economy. This is completely unsustainable with continuing our, our lives. Yeah. Um, so our way of life has to change and that doesn't mean it has to be horrible. It just means, you know, we may not be able to talk on this internet. We may not be able to do this kind of chat anymore because if you know anything about how the internet operates, you know there are server farms all over the world that use unbelievable amounts of energy, that take unbelievable amounts of resources. They're putting them in the Arctic now and they're putting them underwater so that they don't need to use the, the water and the coolants that keep these server farms cool so they can operate. I mean, it's, it's, it's really unbelievable and it's unbelievable that we could come up with this and think this could possibly be sustainable. Yeah. So that's the kind of thing I'm talking about. And, and you know, we, we've, you and I, I can see, are old enough to have lived before all of this stuff. We don't need all of this. And we may have much better lives without it. So we may need to think about having these lives without it. That was my point of, you know, we need to stop. And we might need to go back to ways of living simpler. And there's nothing wrong with that. And probably our lives would be much better and our world would be much better and our environment would be much better. Yeah. So, and I think it really comes from the bottom line is uh, the billionaires, the millionaires and billionaires at the top of these powerful corporations um, cannot cede their wealth or their power. And they just keep creating these unsustainable things that we don't need, but that just make them um, unbelievable amounts of money. Yeah. Well, thank you for all that. I, I, yeah, we, we are absolutely on the same page and that's pretty much why I named the book, The Impossible Conversation. You know, I, I pretty much saw when I got to that moment of confirmation that yes, it's not only as bad as the presentation that woke me up, but it's actually growing more intense and coming at us quicker with every month that passes. And the impossible conversation part is, is your pointing to that we need to stop. And really the, the work that I'm called to do within that is to create a safe, you know, consistent safe containers and resources for people who are brave enough to engage with that conversation what would it take to stop and and i think it's perhaps even the most even more difficult than that full stop because that's actually not possible for most of us in the in the fully developed world it's that's downright heresy and and almost impossible on its own so there's this other, this other model, this kind of bridge between the two, which is to uh, what I basically call a foot in two worlds, which I, I think is one of the most exhausting and um, potentially debilitating ways of living a life that I can imagine. So we're in this extraordinary luxury of this model that's really less than a hundred years old. You know, mm -hmm. we talk about it like it's always been and it, it mm -hmm. hasn't. Mm -hmm. And we now know it's inevitable that some things gotta give, whether they, you know, if somebody can say, okay, we need to slow some things down or we need to reduce this or so on. Or for those who are truthful enough to be able to say that we must stop, to have a foot in the world that is collapsing and to have the other foot in a world that is not yet articulated, not even imagined yet. And then to try and live a life, to try and raise children in that. I can barely imagine, I don't have kids, I've done a lot of work raising young people, but I'm, I'm not a parent but I can imagine what it would be to try and be a parent in that 
foot in two worlds model. Does the way I'm saying that, does that particular um, model of, you know, speaking about this, does it spark you to say anything? Well, um, you know, I'm not a parent either. And that was by choice for a number of reasons. You know, one of our biggest problems in, in this whole conversation is overpopulation. Mm -hmm. Of course, we're overconsuming, we're overproducing, we're creating untold amounts of waste, and part of that is because we have so many people on the planet. Um, and so for that and many other reasons, I've chosen not to be a parent, but I do have a good friend who is a parent and who sort of straddles those two worlds. And um, she and her husband raised um, their daughter in a very different way than most people have. And she, you know, for example, when I see, I, I, you know, like you, I've worked with many students and children. I've taught at every level from elementary school through university. And I've done that for the better part of my life. And um, so I'm around kids all the time. And what I see now is children, um, just glued to their screens. They are completely addicted to their smartphones. In the elementary schools, a lot of the kids don't have phones yet, but even in school, they're tied to iPads or tablets, and they're always wanting to get on them in school. I mean, personally, I don't think they should exist in schools, but, um, and my friend and her husband did not raise their daughter like that. She didn't have any of this technology. She she had um, books around her and she played piano and she danced and she learned to r raise bees and she learned to garden and she, and yes, it was probably a little difficult for her to be different than the other kids her age and the other students, but it's possible and it, and it enriches your life and it, and truthfully, she is much more well prepared for the potential collapse that we may have ecologically. She knows how to survive. She has skills that other kids her age don't have. And so when I think about someone straddling sort of the two worlds, and of course, you know, as I said, we're on the internet right now. None of us can give up everything. None of us can completely stop at this point. We're, we're stuck in this model. It's, it is sort of Tina, like, um, like Margaret Thatcher said. There, they've made it so that there is no alternative. But it's possible to work towards an alternative. And the more of us that do it, the more possible it will be. Um, but those, those who are just following the dominant paradigms and everything that's been taught to us since we were grown are, are not being creative enough to think of a different way of getting through this world and potentially either, you know, saving our species and other species, or at least mitigating the effects of what we've done to the planet on our species and other species. Yeah. Yeah. Brilliant. I, um, in the name of sharing, <clears throat> sharing just a little bit more about what uh, this body of work that I've been uh, engaged with since since my awakening moment, um, at the center of it is uh, I, I've been looking for, you know, being in the training world, I was looking for okay, so what are the processes? What are the experiences that we can offer to people that will um, perhaps uh, in, invite them to an experience of their own transformation, their own awakening. How can we make that uh, more of a, a welcoming invitation for them to want to participate in something like that? Instead of change being something to be terrified of, how could it be more inviting? And um, the, the answer kept coming back, uh, ironically, with some kind of dry language, um, self-regulation, you know, in the, in the neuroscience world and in the self-care, radical self-care uh, dimension, which is obviously critical to anybody who's engaging with this conversation, no matter where they are, no matter what their 
<clears throat> life situation is their parents are not they're young they're old no matter what we all need to be able to have a, an extraordinary ability to generate self-care um, at the at the most you know primary level with our own our own body our own system and then we also need to be able to especially if we're parents or we're leaders of any kind in our community um, we need to be able to share that space. We need to be able to um, invite others to their own levels of self-care. In other words, self-regulation and then also like a group self-regulation. And the, the closest I've found at the group level is, uh, is a sense of, is an experience of ritual. And there, there are some little pockets in in most communities that i uh that i'm in for any reason i tend to you know kind of sniff out where 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 are the groups that they come together and they they leave they get together they spend some amount of time and when they leave they're in better shape better shape meaning they're uh, more fully expressed they have uh they've felt an, ex an experience of others caring about them they care about others. They have an ability of freedom to express with one another what their concerns are, what matters most to them, that sort of thing. Now, these are fairly basic human sharing elements, yeah? And so um, what I've seen is uh, probably the most potent single um, group self-regulating ritual is uh, is a grief ritual in my experience so that we we are so awful at the the experience of the the realization of grief in our world in the especially in the USA mm -hmm. we just seem really uh, uh, terribly cut off from the ability to grieve and to be present with loss and uh, you know that's one element of what I and we are offering is the ability to come together for that purpose, to be able to um, be able to tell the truth with one another about our losses and our grief, and then to be able to access often and most often the, the uh, core joy that's behind that, 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 we being a, a grief phobic culture, we don't get to find out that there is this rich beauty and, and joy on the other side of the grief that we're running so fast to try and get away from. So um, it seems like an emphasis, wherever I can find an emphasis of a group that allows that kind of freedom of expression, invites that closeness, that intimacy, and especially if they'll take it all the way to the level of, of inviting, you know, really core truth, including grief and loss. These are far more functional, kind of another example, like, like the couple that you were describing, just another example of, yeah, there are actually pockets of functional community. So um, does that spark anything? Well, I was going to say, uh, you, when you were beginning talking about sort of self-realization or self-healing, I was thinking more about uh, what I see that we need is more community. Mm -hmm. And I, I do, I think people actually are striving for and really want to hear the truth. I don't think, I think we've been fed, and I think it's all through marketing and advertising, this need for optimism, this need for positivity that keeps us um, complacent. And I don't think it's healthy, and I, I agree. I think we need to have this grief. I had this conversation with my friend just the other day. Um, we, we constantly feel despair over what's going on. We are, we are, both PhDs in the environment, and we we know intimately what is happening, and we don't 
we're not optimistic about it all the time and we're very down about it and we were talking about the need to talk to people about feeling that we have a beautiful earth um, we have beautiful creatures we have beautiful flora and fauna that are going by the wayside and we need to feel the grief of that we can't just pretend it's not happening and oh it'll be okay we we it's healthy to grieve what's going on. It's healthy to feel bad about what's going on. Mm -hmm. And we were, we were saying the same thing just the other day. And then, and then beyond that, to, um, to acknowledge the truth of what's going on. I, I mean, I can't emphasize that enough. I, and I would recommend if this seems more on a tangent, but I don't think it is. Um, Barbara Ehrenreich wrote a book called Bright Sided and talked about mm -hmm need for positivity and how it stifles us. And I think it really, it really hinders a lot of what the progress we can make in terms of dealing with um, our social issues and our, our inequality in society and our environmental predicament. But in any case, I think acknowledging the truth is what we really need to do. And we have to get on beyond the propaganda and the marketing and advertising. And I think people really want to hear the truth, but we have been in a culture for so long where phony rhetoric and propaganda and marketing has dominated our minds that I don't think people can always see the truth. And I think we see that a lot in our politics. I think people are looking for truthful politicians. I think they're looking for um, those who they can vote for that really might play a role in policy making that can help but i think they're being taken in by charlatans because they just don't even know what the truth is anymore and they don't know what is really profound versus what is superficial mm -hmm. um, so i think that's something we need to um, get a hold of and then like you said i i think if, unless we can come together as groups and communities like we used to i mean i'm not that old but i remember a time when I, I grew up in a condominium of like 300 units, and it was a wonderful community for a kid to grow up in, and it was even wonderful for the parents. And we, we actually had a community, we looked after each other. We had a place we can go out and play all day long, every day in the summer, and the, you didn't have to worry about your children. We weren't atomized, we didn't have kids at, in screens, and we didn't have parents worrying about every time they stepped out of the, house because our community protected us. We need to have that again if we are going to go on. And, and that's how we're going to um, deal with the crises that we have from the climate. If we have a solid community, they'll help us, you know, hopefully there will be, if not the community that already exists, but a more global community to come around to these places where these fires have been in California to help them get back on their feet again. Um, so yeah, community building is essential and I think people are really wanting that. I think we're, that's another thing I think we're grieving is that we don't have that anymore and we need it. Mm -hmm. um, and as much, I mean, I, I tend to be sort of a very private and solitary person, but I also recognize the need that I have for community as well. Mm -hmm. And the, the, the good thing is though, I, I've seen more of that coming out as people are getting more and more enraged by our political culture and, our, and what's going on in our society. More and more people are being brought into communities for protests or whatever. And as much as, this is going off on a tangent, but as much as I see some of this protesting as um, not really being effective in making change, I do see it as effective in bringing people together. And I think that's really important to have people come together and have these discussions and finding creative ways to move on in the predicament we're facing and yeah. that, that yeah. we're living in. Yeah, yeah. Well, that, that leads me to, to ask, do you, um, do you have any particular individuals that you think do a for in one way or another do a good job of not just science communication but kind of reality communication at the level that we're talking about today so do you have any 
<laughs> I mean, it's not good for me to say this way, but do you, have, do you have heroes or do you have people that you look up to or are inspired by that, that have a particular flair, particular style that seems um, effective and good? And, and similarly, do you, have, do you see any organizations that really um, like draw you in, into your own calling in a similar way? Let's see. Well, one thing I want to say is I, I try, not that I don't have people I look up to, but I am sort of loath to try to find one person who is going to be our savior and can give us all of their wisdom that we can follow. Because I think, I think that unfortunately, I think that's what a lot of us are looking for. If, I, if this person will tell me what to do, we can solve this issue. And it's, it's going to take all of us. But, you know, I guess it's kind of the the normal um, usual suspects like Noam Chomsky. I mean, that man talk about full of not only knowledge but unbelievable wisdom. Um, and you know, he's not someone who has talked that much about the environment, but he's making that more of a priority in the things he talks about. But at the same time, when he talks about social issues, a lot of that is tied into the environment. Um, uh, Chris Hedges, as we mentioned before, is someone who speaks the truth and, and, and doesn't mince words and says what's really going on. Um, the late Howard Zinn taught us historically, you know, what, just what we came from. And interestingly enough, I still haven't even gotten through Howard Zinn's People's History of the United States, page cover to cover. I've read so many parts of it, and I think I've read a solid half of it. But I, but if you do read that book, you realize that nothing we're going through is new, and that um, people have faced these kinds of things. You know, not climate change to the extent we are now, or the environmental predicaments and the ecological crises we are facing now, but they have faced a lot of what we're facing and the social issues surrounding these environmental predicaments. And we need to learn from those experiences and we need to learn from history. So that's yeah. another person I look at as a hero and someone that I take a lot of wisdom from. Boy, in terms of the environment, um, I can't speak to one person, but they're, well, um, the late um, Theo Colborn, I don't know if you've heard of her, but actually she is quite an inspiration to me because not only did she, she go back to graduate school at a later age, I think she was in her 50s or 60s when she got her PhD, but she started speaking out and studied um, and was one of the first voices to talk about endocrine disrupting chemicals in our environment, which are a huge issue. And when she first started, her and her colleagues first started talking about this, they were um, discredited and they were maligned and, and other scientists and, and of course people in industry were saying that this endocrine disruptors didn't even exist. And this was not real, this was not an issue. And I think at this point we know that it is. And in fact, most of our, most of our synthetic chemicals, if not a good um, substantial amount of them, act in endocrine disrupting ways. And this was, a, um, this was a revelation that I think is, is something that we're gonna still be grappling, we are grappling with and we're gonna continue to be grappling with. And she spoke the truth about that a long time before anybody else did. And so she's quite an inspiration and a hero to me, not to mention that she did it all in later in life. Would you spell her last name? Um, C-O-L-B-O-R-N. Uh, the book she wrote with a couple of in, uh, other scholars and environmental journalists was called Our Stolen Future. And it, Boy, it must have come out almost 20 years ago now, if not 21 or something, but Great. it's something that's still very relevant today. Um, yeah. Yeah, as far as other scientists, I'm having a hard time coming up with individual names. There's a lot of people who've done a lot of great work. 
True. But unfortunately, um, one of the things I was talking to someone else about on a podcast just recently is that um, the way science works and the way academics work is that scientists really aren't supposed to speak out. They're supposed to do their work, they're supposed to collect their data, they're supposed to report their findings, and they're not supposed to speak out about these issues or advocate uh, or be advocates. And um, I think that's I don't, I don't think that's a natural state. I think that's a prescribed state to keep things as they are. Yeah. And um, so, it, so to look for scientists who have been speaking out is, it's hard to find who really feel comfortable enough to speak the truth about what is going on because their careers are at stake. Yeah. Well, I, I've, um... I'm curious, uh, have you been exposed yet to um, and much of the Extinction Rebellion people uh, yes. really starting up in, in the UK, but now it's obviously just spread like wildfire to around the world. And, and um, I believe the, the kind of umbrella <clears throat> organization is Rise Up. Do um, you have any reaction to what they're doing? I was going to mention Extinction Rebellion. Yeah, I think um, I think it's terrific, and I think I hope it rises up all around the world because this is exactly what we need. We need. The, I mean, they are they're calling themselves the Extinction Rebellion. They are facing the truths of the the predicament we're in head on, and they're not mincing words, and they're not trying to water down what's going on, and um, and of course once. Once a group like that gets started, it makes everybody else feel empowered and and comfortable enough to face the truths as well. And and again, there's there's power in collectivism. There's you know as they say, as I guess Billy Bragg may have said, there's power in the union. And I truly believe that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it just in the name of. Uh, <clears throat> putting some, um, some names out that I found particularly inspiring from the more traditional um, climate scientist end of the house. And, and that would be um, Peter Wadhams comes to mind and Kevin Anderson, um, particularly Kevin Anderson uh, for yes. some time. Mm -hmm. um, he, he, for a number of years, was, was really the only climate scientist uh, that spoke as boldly, even with Michael Mann in, in the midst of fighting, you know, the, the good fight that he's fight, he's fought for so long. Uh, there was just been this consistently um, bold, truthful, uh, direct, um, and, and embodied expression from Kevin Anderson, you know, to the, to the point where he, as much as possible, was you know, taking the train and boats to get to the next conference and, you know, that sort of thing. Um, so yes, I, just, I agree. I've only, I've only been familiar with him for a short time, but once I started reading his work, I realized, yes, I agree. Kevin Anderson is someone who, um, and, you know, actually, I think of another scientist that I didn't, or he might be a social scientist who I didn't know um, real well, but I just read something about him and he's someone who has been speaking out. He's been walking the walk. Um, his name is Meyer Hillman, I believe. Uh, yeah. And he, he doesn't, you know, he, he basically says we're doomed. And, um, but the funny thing is just like most of us who, who are not necessarily completely optimistic about where things are going and our ability to change them, he still walked the walk and, and literally walked the walk. He writes and the he ride. <laughs> still did what he could in his part, even though he thought it was all for naught. And that's kind of what I wrote about. I mean, yeah. it, you know, every little thing I do, I do because I, I can't not do it. I, I know the situation and I, I know what the effects of the choices I make are and what effects they may have on other organisms and on other people. So I do it. doesn't mean the world's going to change. It doesn't mean my little effects make a big difference, but I do it anyway. And that, that's very much like Meyer Hillman, I think. Yeah, yeah, he's brilliant. Um, <clears throat> I'm curious, have you, um, 
Have you followed much of the work of Derek Jensen? Oh, yes, yes. Um, yeah, that's funny that I neglected to mention him, I guess, because he hasn't been on my radar for quite a while for some reason. I guess he hasn't put out any new material, but yeah. Um, he's certainly someone who speaks of things as it is, and yeah, and yeah. yeah. he's definitely someone to um, look for his work if, you, if anybody yeah. hasn't encountered it yet. There's a very dear friend um, that I'd like to suggest if you if you haven't already um, read her work is uh, a woman named Deb Ozarko. No, I haven't. Yeah, she's uh, quite a quite an extraordinary person. Uh, I I would say that she's one of the one of a small handful of of exemplars of people who truly have forged a place for that other foot. When I was talking about the two feet and one in collapse, the other mm -hmm. one, God knows what, because it, it, it doesn't exist yet. Right. Um, Deb has really forged a, a, a place to put a foot over here in this unimagined world. And it, it, it requires, in, in my, uh, from my point of view, it, it requires a, some really advanced human capacities to, to create something that has any traction whatsoever over here. Absolutely. One of the words that comes to mind is intent. Really different than intention, you know, like, well, we want to set an intention for today and I want to have more abundance today or something like that. But uh, at the level of um, more of a crystallized intent in the world, there's a, there's a really a, uh, I don't want to use the word purity because it's got, got a judgment in it, but <clears throat> there's definitely a, a level that, uh, that Deb brings to the conversation and, and actually more through her presence. Uh, perhaps this is the best way for me to describe what's got me so um, inspired by, by Deb's work. Um, just her, one small piece of of her abundant writing is about hope, and um, I'm not a big hope fan. I think most of what um, me neither <laughs> the definitions of hope are are kind of a enabling of yes. a business as usual maintenance system that yes. is kind of disgusting actually. So <laughs> look, I'm seeing you nodding. So okay, yes. and Deb has this extraordinary definition that I'd like to just run by you and see if it inspires you to say anything from your perspective. And that is um, that ho her version of hope is uh, activated presence. So to be so present in the moment and then to, to be so engaged and so freed from the encumbrances of that other foot, so to be fully present and, and that level of full presence is actually a level of activation that we just don't have any awareness of whatsoever over here in the in business as usual. Mm -hmm. world. And how she distinguishes it, how she lays it out um, is, well, it's, it's got enough resonance that it, you know, certainly got my attention. And, and it, what I love about it is it, uh, I, we, she and I come from very different tracks of life experience. Mine is more from a shamanic and energetic studies and so on that I had no idea would ever come to such importance as now. You know, it, it had nothing to do with training in the executive training world. And she comes from her own background as well. And um, there's this extraordinary resonance and this, these possibilities, these layers of human living and possibility within that, that again, that ju we just don't get to talk about over here. Mm -hmm. So let me just stop there and see if any, I know it's a little odd and vague, and I'm wondering if anything sparks for you out of what I'm describing. 
Well, I think of two things. I think, first of all, I, I agree with you very much about hope. Um, I think it, it's all part of this positivity culture we have that is nonsense and keeps us complacent. And it keeps business as usual going. Mm -hmm. I, I remember um, there was a documentary made by Spike Lee about Hurricane Katrina. And on the wall of one of the buildings, someone spray painted, hope is not a plan. And I think that's the best way to describe it. Um, but the other thing I was thinking of is, um, and this might be a little different than, than the uh, mindset of your friend, but I've, I've had this discussion, you know, um, in terms of grief, I think one of the things that can come out of the, our grieving our world and what has become of it is anger. And anger can be used for a lot of different things, but I don't think it's necessarily always unhealthy. We, we treat it like it always is. And anger can be fruitful and it could be used to spark action. And I think I had this discussion with some of my students when I was teaching at university and some of the students were, a lot of them were in this, we always have to be optimistic, we always have to have hope. There's, there's nothing behind this. This is what they've been taught by the dominant culture, by the propaganda and media. But I had other students, some of, usually, you know, other ones who are older and more um, thoughtful and be, because they have more experience. And one of the students I remember saying, um, no, I don't think anger is wrong and I don't think um, pessimism is wrong. I think we just need to use them in the right way and they can be used in the right way. Mm -hmm. But to just blatantly say we must be optimistic does nothing. And, and it was great to see. Um, of course, that is, that's what I felt. I didn't want to push that on my students, but it was nice to see some other students recognizing that and recognizing that this blind optimism doesn't do anything yeah. and that there are other things that we're told in our society are bad and to stay away from that can spark our actions. Yeah. The, the word that came to mind when you were describing that, uh, that, um, I don't, I don't want to say it was just a moment. I was hearing you say that that was an experience that happened a number of times with the students you were working with. Um, the, the word that, that uh, kind of wanted to get connected with the anger or rage was sacred when, when I was hearing you. That uh, to me that what shifts anger from something that is usually toxic in our culture because it is frowned on, but it is actually one of the very few, um, especially for males, uh, one of the few emotions that is approved of somehow or validated. And what seems to shift it is the, to include the sacred. There's a, there's a, a like a transformation or a, transmogrification or something there's a way that it in which it goes from being uh something full of vengeance and um that is me meant to harm another and what i'm hearing you point at is that this this sacred anger or rage is actually um very much about uh a promotion of life mm -hmm. what comes to mind is the is the um, classic um, mother lion who is protective of her cubs and lashes out viciously that there's a you know it's a little bit anthropomorphizing so i hope you can mm -hmm. work with but there's this there's this purity at the far end of the sacred anger or rage that is really a stand for life is that mm -hmm. in the ballpark of what you were talking about yeah and i think of it in another way too i think of the um the political and social situation we are in now where we see a lot of angry people who have been let down by our society and rightfully so and their anger is being channeled into white supremacy mm -hmm. and into racism um, and that anger is, 
justified and it's it's okay that those people are angry they should be angry that this this american dream and this culture that we've promoted falsely has let them down but their anger is being redirected toward the wrong things they're being manipulated to you know hate the other hate people who aren't like them instead of looking at who caused these situations in our society, which I would say are these billionaires and these capitalists and corporatists who have ruined our planet, who have um, ruined our economy, who have you know, created this disparate inequality and this terrible situation of poverty and homelessness. And we have all of these angry people, some of whom are you know, using it for fruitful, um sort of actions bringing together to protest and coming together to look for alternative ways of living but others of whom have been, been directing it toward hate and so yeah i i that's what i think of when i think of the anger and i i think we need to acknowledge these people's anger but realize that they're they're being told to direct it or they're, they've been influenced to direct it in one way and that's on purpose. Yep. And it doesn't need to go that way and a lot of these people sort of aren't irredeemable. They really just need help and they could be using their anger for more fruitful causes if they only had people who, who would support them and, and be empathetic or you know, have some sort of compassion for the situation we are all in. Yeah, if they had some sort of a mentorship or guidance that was about life. And, that, and a support system that told them there it's okay to be angry and we're here for you. And, you know, I, I do think a lot of this hate we're seeing now um, is if we had a more egalitarian society, it wouldn't even exist. I think it's out there because of the inequality and I, I, you know, and that takes us off of the environmental realm, but it is all connected because the inequality is also exacerbating our environmental problems because when we have people who are just struggling to survive every day, we can't have people who are focused on you know, making the world more sustainable, basically. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. And that's really brilliantly wrapped up the way you just put it. Um, I'm curious, um, how, how can people find you and how would you like to be known? I, you know, in terms of where do you do your writing or what are you engaged with? How would you, how could people find more of you or your writing if, if they were looking for it? Um, well, I, I actually mostly keep an archive of the writing I've done at rebelpleb.blogspot.com. Um, most of this work has been published elsewhere, but it's sort of an archive of a lot of the recent things I've written. Could, um, could you spell that for us? Sure. Rebel, R-E-B-E-L, pleb, P-L-E-B, that's one word, dot blogspot dot com. It's a bit of my, my husband's writing as well. Um, but uh, I could also be found, uh, a lot of my writing has appeared on Counterpunch and Common Dreams. If you if you do a Google search of me or or don't use Google, use something like DuckDuckGo, um, <laughs> you you can find a lot of my writing that way. And um, I've I've had a lot of wonderful feedback from many people like you. So you can reach me at k underscore mattis at outlook dot com if you'd like to get in touch with me. Um, I am not on social media. It's one of the ways I'm trying to sort of walk the walk. I have a lot of issues with social media yeah. for mm -hmm. a number of reasons. Um, it's probably not to my, uh, it is, it would probably be to my benefit to be on it, but right now I'm not. So those are the main ways that people can get in touch with me. Great. Well, um, as, as we wrap this up, I first wanna just again, 
mention, um, I, I, I guess it's the mortality I've been feeling, you know, creeping up on me, not just because I'm an old guy, but also because of the times. One thing that I, I promised myself to, to do as much as I can remember to is to acknowledge um, when, when there's connection and when there's resonance and um, there's right relationship. And so um, I just experience all three of those things in our brief conversation and in, in reading your writings. And um, I just thank you for your work. I thank you for your clarity. And uh, particularly the thing I want to acknowledge you for is the, uh, um, you know, kind of in the, <laughs> the Naomi Klein school, if you will, that, you know, where that's where I learned to put the pieces together in the, in the way that you so beautifully do, which is to bring uh, issues of social justice, and the various elements, the various layers or gradations of justice issues and how they fit, uh, they're all of a piece with the, the environment as well as, as you just said. And so just thank you for how gracefully you do that. And I wish you much uh, continued success in doing that because we need that kind of voice so much. Um, and I'm curious if, if by chance, if just for a moment, this were not just some small podcast in the corner of the <laughs> of the doomosphere, um, if you had a, a far larger audience for a couple of moments to finish this up, uh, what would you say to people if you had a far larger microphone or or um, podcast moment? <laughs> well, first of all, thank you so much for your generous kind words. I really do appreciate it. And I really enjoyed this conversation as well. Um, I, you know, I was asked that on another podcast and I feel like I, it's such a difficult question and I feel like I completely missed the boat. But I guess what I would say is um, if, you know, so many, most of us on this planet just want to live a decent life and we want um, we want to help others live a decent life. And I think uh, if we really want to, to realize those goals and, and ultimately possibly sustain life on the planet, we really should be prioritizing um, the environment and each other over economics. We need to stop thinking about um, our, our personal goals, our personal dreams, our personal career ambitions, which primarily at this point have to do with wealth and power. And we have to start thinking about our society and our global society uh, and, and start living with that in mind and start living with empathy and compassion for not only the other humans around us, but all of the other beings around us. Um, and I think, you know, I I'm, I'm, have a science background and I study the environment, but I don't think getting through these issues involves um, science like I wrote. I think it involves these kind of core uh, paradigms and values more than anything. And starting from that foundation of empathy and compassion and community, and prioritizing what's real, which is our environment, over what is manufactured, which is our economy, mm. is a good way to start mm. tackling these almost insurmountable issues. Well, again, my, uh, my warm thanks for joining us here on this little podcast in the, in the corner of the cyber world. Um, I'd like to invite you, if uh, you're ever inclined, to uh, come spend a little time with us. Uh, I don't know if when you checked out the website, you saw that there was something called a safe circle call. But um, it's a little free get together every other Tuesday evening. Um, and if, uh, 
if it sounds good to be able to be with folks who have this kind of uh, even keeled um, commitment to uh, being a safe space for each other, to bear witness with each other in these times, and to share in some of the grief and also share in some of that that core joy that we've been talking about. Um, it would be a pleasure to have you join us if you're inclined. Thank and, you. Uh, I just look forward to whatever the next article is that comes out. And thank you so much. Thank you so much. Take good care. You too. It's been a pleasure. Thanks. Thanks so much again. Bye. <laughs> Bye. episode of the Poetry of Predicament podcast produced by Dean Walker and the Living Resilience Alliance, www.livingresilience.net. Music today from Michael Hedges, as always, and also Port Blue into the Sea. You may want to check out our sister podcasts, the New Lifeboat Hour with Carolyn Baker on Podbean and at carolynbaker.net. Also, the Impossible Conversation podcast, another channel on YouTube. Thanks so much for joining us. Join us again later for another episode of The Poetry of Predicament.